I think uh, we feel good about going ahead. Um, Sade is going to start us off with um, <clears throat> with a, a welcome and mind acknowledgement and teachings. Welcome, if it's your first time, and welcome back to everybody for your second week. I'm going to be doing the land acknowledgement and um, a traditional teaching, teaching that was given to me. Um, we do, well, I do land acknowledgements to honor my ancestors, um, past and present, and to acknowledge the land that we're on, which is Turtle Island. And um, more specifically in Toronto, where I'm streaming from, is um, home to the Anishinaabe people. Um, I could have wrote this down. I'm just like <laughs> going off memory. Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, the Huron, Wyandot people, um, and the Mississaugas of the New Credit, and a lot, and home to many um, diverse groups of First Nations people. Um, yes, I'm going to do the seven grandfather teachings, which uh, was was given to was given to was given to a messenger and then the messenger then in turn taught the child is kind of like our sacred law that we go by. Um, there's seven rules to it. Um, wisdom, Nebwa Kawin, the beaver. To cultivate knowledge is to know wisdom, which helps us make decisions that honor our well-being. This is represented by the beaver who patiently uses his, his impressive teeth and creative mind to build sustainable communities. Be humble in knowing where you excel and what your limits are and collaborate with others who have expertise where you may lack. The second one is love. Uh, Zagid, Zagidwin, the eagle. Unconditional love cannot be given without loving oneself. Much like the eagle who soars high and carries these teachings from the creator to share with her young, educate yourself before you speak, consult with mentors and your communities and love yourself enough to overcome difficulties. The third one is respect. Mena den dem moen, the buffalo, which represents the buffalo. Um, as long as we have walked the earth, so have the buffalo, who have sacrificed themselves to give us warmth, food, and shelter. To have respect is to honor all of creation. Balance what you need with what you want and recognize how your own needs can be at the expense of Mother Earth. Do what you can to make a difference and lead by example. The fourth is bravery. Aqua o dewen the bear. Awaken the warrior within you by facing adversaries with integrity. We see these traits embodied in mother bears who guide and protect their young with strength and a playful heart. Remember, you can't take, up, you can't take care of others without taking time for yourself first. Con conquer fears so you can help those you love and don't forget the power of play and humor. Five uh, is honesty. Gwekwa Dizuin, the raven. Facing a situation with truth, kindness, and compassion is to walk with integrity. The raven who uses his own cleverness to prosper is a potent symbol of the power of honesty. Remain true to yourself, love and respect your own natural form. And six is humility. Deba den dizawin, the wolf. To know yourself and your gift in a hum and your gifts in a humble way is to set a good example for others in life. Much like the wolves who are devoted to family. Uphold the power of love. Look for it everywhere and nurture it as long as you would as you would your children. To accept that we all need love to survive is truly humble. Truth. Nebuwin, the turtle. To commit to these seven teachings and see them as fundamental values that complement each other is to know what is to know them within oneself authentically. The turtle who methodically walks the earth as one of our eldest animals reminds us that our teachings that proceed and survive all of time. Walk with these teachings, share these teachings from a true place of regard for their capacity to enrich our own lives and those who we encounter. That's it, Miigwech. Somebody else start. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so okay. Zara Pula will, will talk about some guidelines for us. Thanks so much, Charde. Thank you so much, Day. Um, hi everyone, my name is Susanna. Um, I'm the communications coordinator for local food and farm co-ops. I'm a partner today, I'm supporting uh, the forum here. 
So um, just a few reminders and um, just housekeeping details before we get started. Um, just to let you know that we uh, will be recording today um, the presentations and discussion. If you feel um, that you'd like to for anonymity, um, you can choose to turn your camera off um, or change your name. Um, and um, it is advisable to keep the cameras off, video off if you don't need to be um, speaking at the moment because um, just for bandwidth issues and um, variable Wi-Fi and uh, we did have, I uh, believe, 160 people signed up for the forum, so um, we'd like to be able to um, keep that as we can, please. Um, additionally, if you can keep your mic muted for the duration, um, that would be great. And to let everybody know that we will be receiving a copy of this recording once it's ready. I'm going to keep a note about all these things in chat. And I'm going to also turn over now to Nolan, who's going to take us through who's joining us today. Thank you. Hello, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for coming here and being here today. Uh, my name is Nolan and I'm helping out the EcoJust uh, Food Network put on the forum. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to start by just sharing my screen. So just give me one moment. Um, what I'm really excited is to show this um, presentation because this presentation is the culmination of all of you and all the information that you put in um, the survey. Can everybody see it okay? Thumbs up. Excellent. So um, what I wanted to start with, this is, by the way, available in the community forum, and I only have a few minutes to highlight a couple of things. So please um, check it out on your own. There's a lot of great information in here. But um, I really wanted to start out with just kind of who we are and where we come from, both physically, but also ancestrally. So we come from all parts of Ontario, um, people as far out west is Dryden, people as far east as uh, Ottawa and Kempville, people as far south as um, Burlington, Hamilton, Toronto, Norfolk. Um, we come from all over this province, but we also, and I really enjoy this map here, is we also come from all over the world. So this is really cool. Not only do we come from coast to coast of Canada, from the maritime provinces and the uh, west coast, but we also come from with um, other parts of the world, including in the southern portion of the globe here, you can see we have folks from Argentina, um, or their ancestors from Argentina, their ancestors are from South Africa, from Somalia. Going up into the east, we have ancestries going into China, Japan, um, in uh, the South Pacific, and then going north, we have um, uh, folks who are coming from Finland and the Scandinavian countries, folks from Russia, um, folks from all who have ancestry all over Europe, including myself in the uh, Celtic Isles over there, all coming and being at this food forum. So I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge that you know, it's not just us in the room here, it's our ancestors in the room here and our ancestors from all over the world are embodied within us and gathering here to talk about transforming our food system. So thank you, because uh, it's not only you you're bringing to the table. <laughs> um, so secondly, I just wanted to highlight uh, a couple other things. So yeah, here's a full list you can check out of the actual countries where our ancestors are from, but where are people in the food system? So we have a lot of people who are con who considered by themselves in advocacy and a lot of people in growing um, and some people in academia and distribution and provision as well. And this goes all the way down. So you can see um, we have um, further and further down, we have more and more occupations. Going a little forward, um, we're connected to uh, three farmers unions, seven farms, four food and co-op networks, seven community gardens, two community food co-ops, and on and on. So you can check out the list of different programs that we are all in the room connected to. And I apologize for speeding through some of these slides, but I do want to just um, focus on sort of what we, uh, what solutions we're working on currently. So we have folks who are working on community uh, food hubs in Oasis in St. Jamestown. We'll hear more about that. Um, Northern Ontario Agritech Hub. Um, we have the EcoJust Food Network, of course, that's hoping this. Um, we also have dig uh, the Dignified Food Access Handbook for Thunder Bay. And of course, 
We also have education and culture. People are interested in knowledge exchanges, on-farm school for land-based learning, food culture, whole plant food-based nutrition. Um, we have law and economy, the resurgence of Mi'kmaq law and foodways, regional grain economies. So people looking at more of the macro um, and co-op and community development, including developing cooperative food systems and farms um, and organizing for eco ecological justice, including um, and also innovative uh, economic strategies like bulk food buying clubs, in certain neighborhoods. So these are all things we're working on. And lastly, the last piece before I hand it back is what we wish we could do. So these are our goals and aspirations. Um, we have ecosystem restoration. That's one of my passions, how to deal with waste properly, how to manage our project pop properly. Growing, <laughs> changing the minds of monoculture farmers is a personal um, and one of, of great import to myself. And this goes on. We have community building, government policy and budgeting. We're going to get in there a little bit. Treaties and economies, including, which I think is very important, how to build inclusive anti-racist alternative economies into our own strategies. And lastly, we want to change our food habits, change our education, and of course, the goals of eliminating poverty. So I appreciate you for just taking the time with me to go for a few minutes and look through who's in the room. And this was put together by the wonderful Roxanne Cohen, um, who's been a longtime partner and advocate for this work. So I encourage you to check out the full, uh, the full survey. But I really just wanted to honor, honor all that everyone here is bringing to the table. And thank you so much for being here. Thanks so much, Nolan. Uh, Lily, are you ready to give uh, your overview of the first session discussions? Yes, I am. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. If I can find that share screen button. So my name is Lily and uh, I'm a farmer and also a member of the Equal Just Food Network. And I'll just run through uh, the the discussions that we had last week in the first session of the Emergency Food Forum. Uh, we had pretty wide ranging discussions um, broken out into five breakout rooms um, with uh, each five different uh, topics. Uh, the topics were access to safe and nutritious food, ecological consumption, ecological production, work income and the food system and food system resilience. Um, and basically you can see here this is our mural board where we captured uh, people's uh, thoughts and inputs and you all should have access to this mural board so you can look at the notes in depth yourself um, but what we uh, found is uh, there is a lot of um, common streams of, uh, of thought and consideration uh, even across the different topics. Some um, people discussed the problem of uh, food waste and the lack of food storage, uh, as well as food insecurity, especially amongst uh, Black and Indigenous populations. Um, we talked about uh, the the issue of the ongoing automation of work, which includes agriculture uh, and just the, um, the dilemma that that, that poses, uh, not only to people's livelihoods, but also to the environment um, and, uh, and, and to the ability of uh, people to make a, a decent living um, from agriculture. Um, and yet at the same time, you know, automation also presents a, a lot of opportunities for communities, especially those in the north, um, who face uh, more challenges in agriculture, um, and could potentially use those technologies, you know, to, uh, to provide food for their community. So, uh, so we discussed those uh, kind of contradictions as well. Um, there was a lot of talk, um, across breakout rooms about alternative economies, time banking, um, the sharing economies and so forth. And just the fact that our current food system is quite hier hierarchical, uh, profit driven and very destructive both to human health uh, and, to, and to the environment. And of course, people talked about the need to change our eating strategies, um, the need for regenerative agriculture, for more localized systems uh, and so forth, uh, as well as the challenges that our current policies and regulations pose for community-based um, solutions and, uh, and, and food systems uh, and the need to lower those barriers um, uh, as well as to 
to have regulations that are more geared towards smaller scale localized systems um, so that uh, grassroots players um, can uh, can enter the game on a more even footing. So there, there was so much that we spoke about last week that I can't do it justice. Um, but I do want to encourage people to, to take a look at this mural board. Um, we are using the mural board to capture all of the uh, discussions over um, the three evenings of the food forum. So, uh, so we will be capturing tonight's discussions, you know, in this area here, and we welcome you to, um, to to visit the mural board after tonight uh, so that you can see what everyone else has spoken about as well. So I'm done here. Thanks, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Lily, for uh, presenting what happened last week. So what we'll be up to tonight is um, we're going to be focusing on visioning uh, and collaborating on solutions. We'll have two rounds of breakout sessions oriented toward cultivating solutions and um, political action, respectively. Um, before we do that, we'll have a couple overviews for Black food sovereignty and urban agriculture. Anon, when you're ready, you can let us know uh, when you're ready to speak. Um, I'm ready to speak whenever you're ready. Whenever you're ready to go? Okay, yes. I'll pass it along to you because we'll talk more about the breakouts coming up. So. Okay. Um, okay, so... Um... I'm glad to be here, um, Eco Food Just Network. Um, I've been um, a blessing to be around you folks with the energy focusing on you know the right to food. Um, I'm going to speak on the work the African Food Basket has been doing uh, around Black Food Sovereignty and also with the Black Food Sovereignty Initiative Group. Uh, it's uh, comprised of a lot of um, local advocates, youths, uh, students, just trying to make sure that we. Um, introduce this conversation to the city of Toronto uh, and intentionally to the city of Toronto. Um, we started this conversation about two and a half years ago, um, but uh, we at African Food Basket like to say, we've been doing this for over 25 years and looking to make sure we define how we look at um, sustainable food systems in this city. Um, another, another level, the province and the country. Uh, looking at the state of black food insecurity uh, and it's initiating several different projects. I'm, I'm going to run through a quick set of, you know, look back at what we've been doing and then get into the black food sovereignty piece. So this is this is a, a, a Dinko symbol called Sankofa and it's about said go back and get it. And um, when we think about food sovereignty, we're thinking about going back and get it because we were a full sovereign people. People of African descent, historically, we, we were food sovereign. Food sovereign was the way of life for people of African descent before colonization by Europeans. That's a fact. There's no one to be living in Africa. Uh, Africa Africans had the right to healthy and culturally appropriate foods produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods. In those days, we didn't, we didn't have any other method other than organic agriculture. Um, everything we do around those times uh, were ecologically safe and um, produce uh, some and sustainable methods we use uh, and they define their own food and agriculture system from time immemorial. So the African Food Bank started in 1995. This is our first newsletter. And this, here the headline, we have done it. We plan in and then we get a chance to really start it. And, you know, we started delivering um, fresh, affordable, nutritious, culturally specific foods. And we also had these newsletters and, and lots of other information on um, health, food and nutrition in our community. And we also put in some community newspapers. So they had, they had food physically and then they had food for the, for the mind, brain food, so people could really think about their health and, uh, and eating properly and nutrition and that kind of stuff. So this is what it looked like in, in, in those days. Um, we deliver these baskets all across the city. Uh, we're doing similar, similar work right now. Uh, COVID-19, we're delivering uh, over 700 baskets a week to the most vulnerable in the Black community, uh, seniors, single parents, and large families. Right now, we, we need a 
very huge warehouse because we have over a couple of thousand people waiting to get food. Uh, but we're still taking in ours. We want to make sure that the, the city and the government or whoever supporting this know that there's a lot of black folks out there who need food. And then we got into community food animation, establishing community gardens and uh, school gardens and urban farming across the city. A key part of what we did was cultivating youth leadership. Uh, that's from the, from the beginning of the initiative, we started engaging young people because young people are critical to the success of what we do. And this program happening right now, we have some, uh, we have the, a youth leader at the Black Creek Community Farm who is leading this year, um, managing the farm. So he, he, he started off as a youth leader and now he's managing the, the Black, uh, the Ujama Farm and Black Creek Community Farm. These are some of the folks, some graduation, some actually doing the work. This is in Detroit. This is in Detroit, uh, and this is in, in Rexdale. And they're doing this work, uh, loving it. Because of the cultivating youth leadership, we were able to start a Ujama farm program where we engaged farmers of African descent in farming. And this was done at Black Creek. At that time, it was Black Creek Urban Farm before this new version, Black Creek Community Farm. Uh, and then we also had a farm site at uh, in Brampton at the McVean farm. It was an incubator farm and we had an incubator within an incubator. And this was an incubator, people of African descent. This is some of the farms, um, 12 tribes of Israel, Jigna Organics, Green Organics, Kaluman, Green Life, Cultivating Youth Leadership. And actually that's around 2007, 2008. And some of these farmers are still at McVean farm farming. We started the conversation on race and food security. We did a forum in, in the um, Lawrence Heights area. And um, the event um, invited our good friend from the United States, Hank Herrero, he passed away, sorry for, for that last year, uh, a very good comrade. And this was the beginning of a conversation on race and food security in Toronto. Um, and from 1999, 2000, we got involved in the Green Food and Justice for All work by being part of the Community Food Security Coalition. And um, it was a very, very, very enlightening experience. I see my sister Sandy Harrison on this call. She, she can recall these days. Um, she traveled to Minneapolis, Minnesota, um, Milwaukee uh, for some of these gatherings. Uh, this, this, I get to know that this was the beginning of the food justice movement in, in, in the world, really, uh, using the word food justice. Uh, and this, this started, I would say, my experience started around 2000. Food sovereignty, the right of people to communities and countries to define their own agricultural labor, fish and food, land policies which are ecologically, socially, and economically and culturally appropriate to their unique circumstances. We're talking about the right to food, and that's what we're talking about right now with the Black Food Sovereignty Initiative in Toronto. We realize the state of food insecurity in our community, and I know a lot of you guys are familiar with this particular statistic that was uh, a research collaboration between proof and food share uh, the state of food insecurity, people of African descent, uh, black households are uh, 28.4 times uh, more than the overall, that's, that's 12.4. Uh, income strongest linked to food insecurity, you know, a lot of, in Canada, the rate of food insecurity is 12.4, about one in eight households. If we break the number down by race, things look quite different. Uh, things will look more, more different if we do it in Toronto, we try now, to do this research on Toronto, because this reflecting the whole of Canada. I assume Toronto it might be way more than 28.4%. Black food sovereignty, first step, um, we started conversations with community members, especially key stakeholders within the black community who are involved in food systems work. People like Paul Taylor, Letitia Diawu, um, uh, Milana Roberts, um, I can get myself in trouble. Uh, I ain't calling everyone, but um, lots of folks involved in it. Uh, my good sister in Peach Tree, uh, Tanashi Kanengoni, uh, Alvis. Yeah, a lot of folks who 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 been who defining the food food systems work along anti uh, black um, and on anti black lens and looking at how they could make sure that we could have a city that is much more equitable when we're looking at food security. So we did some outreach. We had conversations uh, in the East, a conversation in the West, conversations downtown to make sure that we have that conversation in our community so we could talk about what is Black food sovereignty. 
So we did community consultation with black leaders, black sovereign community organizations, um, and different even organizations that were just involved in the black community doing service. We had talked to a lot of folks. Last September, we had the first annual Black Food Sovereignty Conference. Hopefully we can have this conversation every year because this conversation has to continue for a very long time on November 27th and 28th. We had a good gathering, it was good conversation. And uh, so we just keep moving forward with that. Um, we we are having, because we have a good relationship with the city confronting anti-Black racism, racism unit. Uh, for the last two years, we've been working with them to see how we could negotiate resources like funding and also they have a particular work that they're doing to looking at setting an anti-racism uh, action plan for the city this black food sovereignty initiative is part of that plan the city is now initiating a black food sovereignty plan uh, we had a conversation with the toronto public health a couple of weeks ago i think two months ago and they're they're in they're responding to the work that we're doing so say in June 2020, in response to the health impact of anti-Black racism, the Board of Health declared anti-Black racism a public health crisis. It is a crisis. A series of initiatives to address this challenge, including the development of a Black Food Sovereignty Plan were approved. And so we've been having this conversation via the conference and um, we having this continual conversation to see how we could change the policies of the city when they look at the state of black food insecurity in Toronto. So the three plans, the plan has three interlocking goals that we're looking at. Develop a city supported black led initiative that gives addressing food insecurity issues that disproportionately impact black communities. Identify and, and establish sustained support and funding for food focus, B3 organization and black food sovereignty community infrastructure. I must say, what is B3 organization? B3 organization is black organization that are black led Black serving and Black mandated. It's critical for us to develop Black leadership because we realize there are a lot of organizations meaning well, doing food systems work, but they don't serve the Black community in the way that we, we have a crisis. They are not fo functioning as a crisis. We, we are in a state of crisis right now. We have Black youths killing each other all over the city. Um, it doesn't seem to, to, to worry anyone, but if a white youth got killed like during Kriba, it's a whole big, so we, we know that we gotta define uh, in many ways, not just food, but many areas of development within our community. So identifying and establish sustained support and funding for food focus, B3 organization and Black Food Summit community infrastructure. When we start with infrastructure, we talk about a Black Food Center that we could, we could have a food store, we could have a, a, a incubator kitchen, we could have the resources that's necessary for developing and developing leadership within the Black food system and, and, and the Black community. Engage, align, and leverage new and existing city strategies and initiatives that advance system change and trade goals to realize Black food sovereignty outcomes. We're talking about, about the, the food, um, what's it? Um, there's an agriculture plan, and um, I, I just lost for words for the other food initiative that come out to the city, but I can come out to me. Um, Black Food Sovereignty, the right of people of African descent to healthy and culturally appropriate food produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods. And that's so true. Um, and the reason why we're doing it, because we realize, you know, there's lots of money floating around, but this work is not being done intensely in our community. Uh, we're not developing leaderships. I like to tell folks, um, without any disrespect for young white women, when I got involved in food justice work, it was because I see young white women coming in the black community doing uh, community garden animation work. And it, it, to me, it was so simple uh, to do that kind of work. I would say it's simple for me because I, I really spent a lot of time doing that particular kind of work. But I also realized there were folks in these communities, these low income communities who had degrees, PhDs and 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 uh, and masters in botany and agricultural systems. They were driving school bus and working at factories. And these young white sisters coming in the community and they're doing programming. They just go on the internet. They look for some stuff and they come. I think that was not right. That's one of the main reasons I got involved in food justice work because I wanted to make sure these women who had sometimes four or five children going to the factory and they they come from places like Somalia and Ghana and they have this they qualified to do this work. And they 
leaving the community and going to a factory to work, to spend all this time studying. So that really motivated me to get involved in, in, um, in food justice work. So we have about a, a minute left, Anon, if you're able okay. to um, I, I think I'm just about finished. Um, we're going to emancipate ourselves from mental slavery because whilst others might be free, the body, the, the body, no one but ourselves can free our mind. This is the great Marcus Garvey. And I like to tell you folks, anyone who like to know about black people, this person is one of the major players historically about black development. The Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey. If you don't know Marcus Garvey, you don't know black people. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Anand, for uh, that really incredible introduction to Black Food Sovereignty. Um, Rhonda, do you feel ready to start talking to us about urban agriculture? Yes, thank you. I was just uh, looking around for, for the reactions button so I could be uh, clapping for Anand, <laughs> uh, thank but I'm here. You. Thank, you. Um, thank you. Yeah, so um, uh, hello, everyone. Um, thanks for uh, giving me a few minutes to, uh, to talk about urban agriculture and, uh, and food policy. Um, Ramadan Mubarak to, uh, to anyone who's uh, celebrating today. Um, and I want to say I'm, I'm really honored to, to be sharing screen time here with, with Anan. Um, he's a respected leader in food justice for so many years. Um, I remember him being active when I first started and, and he shaped my thinking a lot. So it was really great to, uh, to hear from Anan. Um, so I've been asked to speak a little bit about urban agriculture and, and food policy. Um, and I know, uh, we've kind of identified this tension between people who are really interested in, in getting out of the existing food system and creating alternatives to it, um, but at the same time understanding that uh, we need to do some bigger policy work in order to, to create systemic change, both locally and on, on a global level. So, um, you know, I think it's really painfully obvious what happens when you make policy without involving people who are actively involved in the work and in the communities who are who are impacted. Um, I feel like I need to make a bit more of a case for practitioners uh, to care about policy. Um, so I would say, you know, if you want to set up your own urban agriculture project uh, without someone telling you that, well, you know what, you can't do that here, or you can do it, but you know what, you're gonna have to pay $100,000 and jump through two years of bureaucracy in order to do it. Um, if we don't want to see that happening, if we want to have the freedom to create our projects, we also need to spend some time um, making sure that decision makers uh, are understanding the importance of growing food in the city. Uh, and when I talk about decision makers, um, I want to be clear, I'm talking about politicians for sure, I'm talking about city bureaucrats, uh, I'm also talking about uh, funders who uh, can provide support for our, for our projects and um, residents, because if you don't have residents um, supporting you, uh, they can put a stop to projects that you want to do on the ground. So these are all people that we need to, to, to bring on board. I was really happy to see a picture of, uh, of Wayne Roberts in your presentation, Anna. Um, I always have a little Wayne Roberts in my head. You know, ask not what the city can do for food, but what food can do for cities. And that's pretty key to making a, a case for, for urban agriculture. How does urban agriculture um, fit into existing city priorities? Um, and how does it help the city do the work that it needs to do? So if you're trying to bring champions on board for what you're trying to do, these are our ways to, to do that. Um, and, and actually, if, if it's not your priority to, to help the city in any way or to the city capital C um, or to appeal to decision makers. Um, this conversation also relates to how work in our movement um, overlaps and intersects. So um, the next things I'm going to say I'm hoping will help us tie together that those two questions of you know, practitioners, policy, but also um, all of the different dimensions of the eco justice food movement. So um, the definition of urban agriculture is expanding. Um, now when we're talking about urban agriculture, we tend to include pollinator gardens, for instance, not food for us, but food for, for all creation. 35% uh, of the world food crops rely on pollinators. So if you want food, you need to support all of the uh, organisms that, uh, that, that help food uh, 
be created. Um, other ecological services. So things like um, creating permeable surfaces for healthy water cycles. The water goes right into the ground, gets filtered, doesn't go rushing through the sewer system and out into the lake carrying all kinds of toxins. Um, gardens improve air quality, um, reduce the heat island effect. These are all very tangible things that people can feel a difference in the city. Uh, we could talk about reducing carbon emissions, but that's, that's a little more complicated. So I won't get into that. Um, gardens are also um, in some ways supportive of reconciliation with Indigenous peoples. Uh, when we're creating garden spaces for Indigenous people, we're creating spaces for medicinal plants, for foraging, um, starting to think about even fishing as being urban agriculture, uh, in incorporating space for, for ceremonies. Um, for the rest of us to, to, to see and learn about these gardens, it's about learning to care for the land uh, that provides us with our food. It's about understanding our responsibility to the land and to the people who cared for it and have a deep knowledge of growing in this space. Um, urban agriculture is also about creating public spaces for, um, for resilient neighborhoods. So neighborhoods that can respond to the crises that we're seeing right now, whether it be the climate crisis, whether it be uh, weather-induced crises, um, or there, as Anand said, the, the crisis of, of um, anti-Black racism. So uh, gardens are places to get exercise outdoors and you connect to nature. We've all seen during the pandemic how important this is um, to us. These are places to hold public events, to bring people together um, and places not just to welcome, but to actually celebrate the leadership and the knowledge of BIPOC and LGBTQ2S plus communities, people who experience poverty or health issues. These are all people who have real knowledge about growing food and can demonstrate what they uh, contribute to a community in these spaces. Um, there are also places to get information and uh, support in times of crisis. And um, if you wanna see an example in other places in, in Japan, the federal government actually gives money to urban farms to be these centers of community preparedness for times when um, there is either some kind of a disaster or, or crisis. So um, at the end of, uh, in a few minutes, I'm going to uh, drop some resources in the, the chat box and I'll, I'll send you the link for that, the, an article about Japan. Um, so if anyone can fit all of that into a 30 second elevator pitch, <laughs> I'd really be in your debt. It's always hard to, to, to try and compress everything that urban agriculture can do into a few minutes. Um, and, you know, I, I don't think anything of what I'm saying right now is news to this, this audience, but, um, but I really want to emphasize that this is the message that we need to, to get out beyond our circles. We need to be telling this story. Um, and we need to intentionally structure the projects that we're creating so that collectively they offer this range of benefits. Uh, because if you're not intentional about it, it doesn't just happen. Um, so let, let's keep that in mind. Um, I wanted to raise, raise the example of, of New York. Um, community gardens in New York, there were hundreds of them that were threatened with closure at one point. Um, but because these spaces acted as community centers and venues for music and poetry, whole communities came out to support them. So, and, and they were spared. Uh, so the more people have a stake in a place, the more people you have to fight for it. And this is true for the movement as a whole. Um, I wanted to just share a few examples of, of some of the tangible outcomes of, of food policy work. So I don't know if people know uh, about the, the new urban farms in Flemington and, and Malvern. Well, it was a Toronto Food Policy Council that brought together other city staff, uh, Hydro One, community organizations, and Toronto urban growers um, through a seven year process. And now as a result of that process, we have um, two new really significant sized urban farms in racialized communities. Um, the TFPC also worked with um, Councillor Joe Cressy from the, from the Board of Health to get community gardens and food markets open last year around this time when they were originally closed for uh, pandemic or emergency measures. So civil so society actors, you know, garden organizers, developed some guidelines, but it was the TFPC that provided the legitimacy internally within the city to get these guidelines adopted by uh, parks and by public health. And, uh, and that's why this year we're also able to have our gardens open. 
I would also say that um, that community garden food market reopening is part of a broader political success and because people across Ontario uh, spoke up loud and clear in support of essential food services. So, you know, sometimes we can put pressure on governments to make them listen. And that, that was um, a really good example. Um, I just have a minute left. So I wanted to share some initiatives, but what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna give you links in the chat box. I don't need to, to really talk about them. Um, but I do wanna give you some questions to think about um, as we're having the next uh, couple of breakout groups. So um, one is, if you can only choose one course of action, what would you choose and why? And the reason I'm asking that question is I think it's important to really articulate our reasons why we're doing what we're doing for ourselves to stay focused, to, but also to communicate clearly to others. Um, and also just to just keep checking in about whether we're um, actually accomplishing what we want to do. So if we know why, then we can figure out whether we're, we're accomplishing it. Um, second question would be, what connections do you see between growing food in the city and some of the other dimensions of eco-justice that we're talking about today. Um, I laid down some, some really quick conceptual issues um, this time. Let's also get down to some examples of actual work and collaborations. I would love to see those, the, those um, boards covered over with examples of people who have been working together, bringing all of these issues together. Um, and the last question I wanted to ask folks, maybe think about, see if it sparks your interest. Um, relationships, I think, are everything to our work. We can't do the work we do without these connections with other people. So how do we develop real respectful relationships um, and then hold each other accountable? What are, what are some of the actual mechanisms, ways that we work together that, that, that help us to, um, to develop better relationships and to know that, that those relationships are working for each other and for the movement? And at that point, I'm going to stop because we have so many great conversations to have. Thank you so much for letting me ramble for a few minutes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rhonda. Really appreciate it. Um, Susanna, are you ready to, to introduce the breakout rooms? Yes, absolutely. Um, so everyone, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you so much, Rhonda. I really appreciate um, all the words you're and everything you're able to tell us about um, the incredible work that you've been doing and um, uh, all the amazing stuff with uh, urban agriculture happening throughout the city. Um, so we are going to break into some breakout rooms. Um, and um, when we enter into this first round of breakout rooms, we're going to have two rounds, by the way. So the first one here, um, we really want to talk about um, grassroots solutions. We're cultivating solutions and, um, and really what that means um, for each of these different kinds of topics. Um, you're gonna have uh, the option to be able to select your breakout room. Um, just taking a look at what we have here so far. So we have four to choose from right now. Um, there's time banking and alternative economies. There's cooperative alternative food land access. There's black food sovereignty and cultural food diversity. And there's food security and climate change, urban ag and infrastructure. So first we're gonna do these breakout rooms um, and we're going to come back and have a, a little bit of a discussion and um, talk with our facilitators. And then we're gonna have a break. And then we'll have a second round of breakout rooms which really dives more into um, policy solutions. All right, everybody. So um, uh, I'm yeah. kind of, I'm getting ready in just a minute as everybody gets back. Um, we're just gonna do a little quick um, report back on the different breakout groups. So I'm going to share my, um, one second, I'm going to share my um, Miro screen and um, I'm going to ask the facilitators from each group to uh, just uh, share a little bit about um, what they were talking about. Okay. Let's see one second. Okay. Can everyone see my screen? Is it working? Not yet. Not yet. No. Okay. How's that? Everyone see? <laughs> All right, there we go. So just bear with me one second. So um, I'm going to ask if if we can have the person from um, one second. Sorry. Creating solutions. Apologize. Just give me a quick second. 
All right, there we go. Excellent. Um, cultivating solutions, time banking, and alternative economies. Uh, can I just ask if the facilitator or facilitators from that would just speak a little bit on what they talked about? Hi. Uh, Lily and I were the facilitators there, and Erica May was taking notes. I'm, I'm Dragos, everyone. Um, so we started, we talked about, um, Lily took us through the food core which um, she talked about last week as well, which is uh, the EcoJust Food Network's um, Time Bank initiative, um, which we went over last week, uh, but we wanted to kind of refresh and talk about it because that's one actionable uh, Time Bank that we're in the process of um, boosting and uh, piloting and proving. So uh, we were excited to talk about that. And uh, we talked about how it is um, related to St. Jamestown Co-op's time bank as well. Um, and the reciprocity of that relationship as well as like reciprocity as one of the foundational elements of time banks and of this to kind of alternative economy, which is uh, like the type of mutual aid giving and receiving, um, building these reciprocal relationships. Uh, so that was something that um, folks commented on that they really appreciated about time banks um, or alternative net networks in general that they were able to deliver. Um, Lily, am I missing something that we're talking about? Uh, we also talked about how in this uh, capitalist system, it's seeped into our, our very attitudes mm -hmm. um, and uh, you had compared, I guess, the um, the different cultural attitudes in, in other countries and, you know, how people in other uh, cultures um, willingly, you know, lent their time and energy to helping others. Uh, whereas here, we're very miserly with our time and with our help. <laughs> you know, it's like yeah. we count out our minutes <laughs> as if they were dollars and, and so forth. Um, and we also talked about how in a time banking economy, you know, um, groups like seniors who aren't valued in this economy would be actually uh, huge sources of um, jobs and value creation in a time banking economy. Yeah, and the way that labor that is not traditionally recognized uh, in our society or in our economy um, gets recognized in this sort of alternative system um, and how we need that. That's uh, how we kind of finished off talking about the the crucial importance of the necessity of these uh, alternative uh, markets, these alternative views on how we value labor and how we value each other's time and work uh, is very important. Awesome. Thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate that. And I'm looking forward to um, after the meet, after the forum, of course, going through more in more detail and looking at these notes. Thank you so much. Um, so the next group uh, I helped uh, facilitate, which was the Cultivating Solutions, uh, Cooperative Alternative Food Land Access. And just to give like a one, one minute um, overview of what we did, Rhonda was in the group and she brought again, like, let's look at actual examples of, of, of people you know, dealing with these questions about how to equitably share power and share our resources. So um, I talked a little bit about the food core. We went into uh, local food, uh, farm and food co-op. Um, we also looked at uh, garden sharing and yard sharing and liberating lawns, as well as community land trusts allow um, basically as a way to sort of um, get over some of the obstacles around owning or being on land collectively, particularly around uh, municipalities and zoning. Land trusts are a way sort of to um, leap over some of those obstacles. Uh, we also talked about 
um, how, some of the how, like how we actually do this, how do we make sure it's accessible, their trust, their incubator. So we began that conversation over here. And then we sort of looked at, um, just at the end, we had a little bit of an introduction to sociocracy, which I'm gonna ask if people are interested in to look up and learn more about, um, as I just learned about it, which was, and it was really cool. So a little bit of homework for everybody. Um, that's the down and dirty report on our breakout room. And I'm oh. now gonna pass it on over to Cultivating Solutions, Black Food Sovereignty and Cultural uh, Food. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to the facilitator or facilitators from this group. So that'd be Day, Sierra, Andrew. Great. Who wants to? I, I guess I can. I can talk and summarize. So it was a really interesting conversation. Day, uh, Sierra, do you want to? Do you want to talk instead? Sure. Um, so we talked a lot about. Um, where we were from, you can hear me, right? Uh, we talked yes. a lot about yeah. where we were from, um, what organizations and histories, um, as well as a little bit of ancestry that brought us to, to the group specifically of Black Food Sovereignty and Indigenous uh, First Nations Food Sovereignty. Um, we, met, we talked about how the allyship of uh, Black Food Sovereignty and First Nations was a powerful thing, uh, briefly. Um, talked about how um, food brings people together, um, a little bit about the history of food in Ontario, how first it was, you know, what grew here naturally and what was cultivated by the people who live here. Then um, during the colonization of the areas, um, yeah, during the colonization of the areas, um, it was all the foods that came with the people who were um, settling and colonizing. And so that brought, as well as the food waste um, that that would have brought. <laughs> so foods that weren't necessarily from here. And now um, there's people from all over the world as well as bringing in foods from all over the world um, food that uh, we wouldn't have, like that didn't grow here as well. So it's kind of, Toronto is an amazing, and greater Toronto area, Ontario, is an amazing mash of cultures and everything where like uh, quote unquote normal, normal food isn't what, isn't like you're, you know, you look at a box and you're like, oh yeah, McDonald's or whatever, right? It's you, you, you come across all these different foods and peoples and everything. Um, so that was really interesting. Um, let me keep scrolling up these notes. Yeah, um, we mostly talked about the diversity of the food that's here as well as the diversity of people. Um, am I missing anything, anybody? Um, no, I think I think that was pretty good. It's uh, just being able to grow culturally appropriate food is is not just you know good for for food sovereignty, but it you know it gives it gives people what they want to to eat and is a is a sustainable way of having food that people like um, moving forward. Um, and then also talked about the uh, there's an event happening next uh, next week, um, the Black Food Sovereignty event. So that's uh, something that people may want to check out as well. And that's on this uh, yellow sticky note here, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Okay, perfect, excellent. What, 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 what I like about the conversation is the and the idea of the the um, twinning of the two cultures of indigenous and people of African descent doing a project from the maroon lands in Jamaica and Toronto cabbage tongue. Um, hopefully it's also in the rural areas of, of Ontario other than cabbage tongue alone, no disrespect to cabbage tongue, but uh, <laughs> also, the rural area and the maroon tongue in Jamaica uh, of, a, of, a, of his, his ancestry and twinning these two cultures together, I think that's a beautiful thing. Anand, can you just mention um, uh, about the event next week, um, just one line about it, and maybe put a link in the chat? 
Um, okay, I, I did put a link in the chat. You did. Yeah, but I can, I can do it again. Well, next sure. week, we, we have a round table on Black Food Sovereignty. We will we, be inviting um, a, a special guest, um, somebody who I have a lot of respect for, and that's Dawn Morrison. Um, she would be um, oh yeah she would be presenting and these folks from uh, corporate Jackson Kali and um, help me out Susanna Kali and Saki uh, Jawea, but she goes by Saki Hall yeah and they will be coming and, and we can be just continue the conversation on black food sovereignty to hear from community members and uh, and everyone who want to to be involved, it's open. It's going to be a national gathering, but with a focus on Toronto because it's the Toronto Black Food Sovereignty Initiative. And and these these keynote speakers, we we looking to looking for examples in food sovereignty work that's been done. And I know uh, for the Indigenous community, I went to a conference in British Columbia around 2006, and this is where I first. Um, heard the term uh, indigenous food sovereignty. And um, I went to Montreal and I heard it again a couple of years ago. And um, so um, th these experiences gonna be, we're gonna be exploring next Saturday. And it could be from 12 noon to 5 p.m. We're gonna have two breakout group, groups similar to this, to having discussion and discussions and then we're gonna have a plenary. Actually, we can have 10 breakout groups. So we're hoping to get lots of folks. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that. And this in particular about the event for folks to participate in. Um, I was wondering um, if the facilitators from our, our last group here, Cultivating Solutions, Food Security and Climate Change, Urban Ag and Infrastructure, um, might be uh, willing to talk a little bit about what was going on. Um, yeah, of course. Um, hi, everyone. So um, this is a really great um, breakout section. We had a lot of folks um, doing different urban ag work throughout uh, Southern Ontario, which was fantastic to hear all the great initiatives going on. Uh, and kind of um, the discussion came about to talking about different models that we have in place and that are very um, useful in cultivating a lot of different so uh, current solutions. Uh, such as the, uh, the, the Oasis food, uh, food Hub in uh, St. Jamestown. And kind of like noting some of the, diff like, um, the opportunities and difficulties that are happening with this type of work. Um, the big question that was presented was how do we get policy to happen and to really uh, support this type of work. Um, there was quite a, quite a bit of uh, discussion about just what kind of model was really, uh, is re is really interesting. For example, um, talking about, um, well, Joe just mentioned right now in Northern Ontario, Every Tech was a really interesting um, project that was mentioned. Also, pro projects in uh, in Vermont that kind of like the very interesting opportunities for going in, go on to develop urban urban agriculture. And here, particularly, has been a really uh, in, in uh, southern in, in Toronto has been really difficult for some urban ag uh, kind of uh, organizers to to develop. Just like uh, problems with zoning, problems with uh, working with civil servants that are just policies that's really slow to 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 to, to happen but that models really serve as a really inspirational um insp inspiration for many is to to really continue our to continue our work um and also d discussing a lot of the different uh, programs that are involved kind of like uh, cultivating a uh, really a uh, close relationship with uh, with plants agriculture creating kind of community support and traditions and um also kind of looking at different solutions that are being um, that 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 include kind of waste, uh, disposable waste, um, that happen all all within kind of like a circular um, dynamic within an urban ag system. So that's kind of like a discussion that we're going on. It was really interesting to hear about the different barriers and solutions, and people really um, kind of are keen on paying, say, campaigns or pre or applying pressure to politicians to really push these um, these solutions forward. Uh, kind of look identifying really friendly. MPPs like Mark Schreiner from the Green Party who has been really friendly um, on on that and on that front. Um, am I missing anything? I know I have have great um, I, I had some great co-facilitators. So please, Joe or Yasmin, if there's anything I missed, please please mention it. Well, I think we talked about in the little micro things that folks can do, but the challenges of making things uh, grow big enough to actually impact food security uh, or food sovereignty. 
um, and the, the tension between doing little examples and scaling them up to have meaningful impact. And thanks for that, uh, uh, Laura. That was also um, something that was discussed. Thank you. Straight in the chat. All right. <laughs> Um, Yasmin, thanks so much for letting me do this. I'm going to turn it right back to you. <laughs> uh, thank you, Nolan. I believe um, we're about to take a break now. Um, so folks, I think we'll take a five minute break, if that's okay. Um, and we'll come back for Josephine's overview, as well as a second breakout room. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. So I wanted to sort of switch focus a little bit and bring us into discussing advocacy, uh, political action, you know, policy action. And uh, I'm sure many people are aware that there is a United Nations Food Systems Summit coming up. And, you know, this is being organized in a variety of ways where there are summit dialogues, there's a big platform where people can engage and talk in various action tracks. Very interesting. It looks really good on the surface. And, you know, I think it's an important place to be heard. And it's an important place to highlight the fact that while Canada might be traditionally known as, you know, this lovely human rights country where we don't have many problems, um, I think this is an important place to be uh, making some helping people understand that we have issues here uh, with food security and that even though Toronto is seen as a world leader around food policy and such, it's been a lot of challenges actually implementing those many lovely policy statements like GROWTO and things like that and the Land Food Pact. Um, we see that federal government has put together a food policy council, which is a good sign, but at the same time, none, no level of government has any um, ministry or department that is looking at the food system as a whole. So there are lots of different um, parts of government that work on different parts of the food system. And this is part of the reason why it's very difficult to get changes to happen. We have seen some recent success with um, farmers for regenerative farming and climate action. They got a little bit in the federal budget to help farmers start doing more agroecological work and um, carbon drawdown in terms of how they do agriculture, some supports for that. So that was a small step in the right direction. But when it comes to food access, you know, the government policy has been largely focused on food banks, charity, um, things like that. And in terms of emergency food, it's been extremely challenging to try to get healthy food into communities that need it the most. So while I'm thinking that it would be a really good idea to have a UN Summit Dialogue and put that into the pipeline and showcase what's going on in Toronto and the struggles that we're having, but also some of the great ideas that we have. There's also um, been a lot of pushback around how this UN Summit has been organized. So some of the um, rapporteurs on food security have pointed out that this new food summit started um, with the World Economic Forum um, as a partner. And that's the first time that's happened with the UN. You know, the UN is a very big, complicated system. I've done reports to the Human Rights Council and the like where they really criticize Canada pretty hard for not walking the talk. But at this point, this food summit seems to have been somewhat hijacked by um, the World Economic Forum, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and uh, organizations like that. And it was a long struggle just to get the human right to food to be a part of this food summit's focus. So as a result of that, there are a lot of um, organizations that are now coming together to try to work on creating an alternative kind of food summit or forum. And I feel like if we do our work that we can present what it is that we're trying to achieve and what it is that we're concerned about, that we can also contribute that work into um, alternative forms and um, work with organizations like Via Campesina so that we can link up across different parts of the world with people who are doing similar work and try to become more of a force to push back on this ongoing and constant struggle between 
the food system as a commodified opportunity for profit for corporations, whether it's everything from the Monsanto farming and chemical inputs to you know, the great big food corporations that move food all across the planet and are creating um, a lot of damage both to human health, soil health, ecological health. You know, we need to have um, a lot of pushback and work in solidarity with people around the world to try to take a different route, to try to, you know, grab the opportunity to create spaces for food sovereignty and agroecology, because really human survival depends on this. It was said recently by uh, Lester Brown that food is the new oil. And that's something we need to concern ourselves with is what kind of solutions are we going to have in our communities? What kind of solutions are going to be implemented and put in place in order to feed the growing population of the world and to overcome the challenges of climate chaos? So we are thinking you know, that we may try to organize another summit or a little another forum where we can pull together our thoughts and our demands and ideas to put into the pipeline for both the formal UN summit so that we can challenge the corporate power of, in that summit, but at the same time um, have uh, our voice heard and walk in solidarity with those who are from indigenous communities, small farmer communities, fishers and the like around the world. So hopefully we can have a presence in both of those sort of macro geopolitical exercises around food sovereignty and food security. And I also was hoping in this next second breakout room, um, second breakout round that we could discuss how we can utilize the open letter, which was developed out of last year's food forum, which, you know, forefronts the various commitments that government's been making that shows, you know, that describes the issues that we're facing and that makes some very specific demands around investing in land infrastructure and resources for a healthy food system that talks about getting more support for organizations, co-ops and farms to mobilize a prepared workforce to get decent livelihoods out of being a part of our food system. That we make sure that we do have self safe working and healthy living conditions for all farmers and food system workers. Basically the human right to food, the human right to decent work, um, all those things. How do we shift policies and shift resources and shift funding and governments to work with us on that. And then lastly, the extremely difficult but very important work of ensuring that our civil services start to learn to collaborate with civil society around this work because, you know, they, um, they're sort of stuck in, in a kind of broken civil service system that has been corporatized and it's very hard for them sometimes to be able to work with us even if they want to because of the linear silos that they're trapped in. So um, finding ways to move all this work forward alongside with our government, because unfortunately, isn't a good example with Oasis Food Hub in St. Jamestown, we certainly have the answers, the models, the ideas, the proposals, the budgets, you know, the whole nine yards, but um, it's very difficult for government to be able to collaborate on supporting what we're trying to achieve. So, you know, as many organizations have found across the city and across this province, it can be very challenging to implement projects on a scale that make a meaningful impact in um, creating more healthy food systems. So the open letter is sort of designed as a tool for everybody to be able to use as they're trying to push for their solution. And we would like this breakout room to be an opportunity for people to discuss how we could utilize the UN summit, how we could utilize the open letter and how we can actively support black food sovereignty, black and indigenous food sovereignty as a way to shift and move all of these things forward and fulfill the dish with one spoon treaty. So I encourage folks to really think outside the box and figure out, you know, what are the advocacy and political action strategies that we can exercise over the coming months to make sure that we have a real impact and are able to meaningfully make change happen over the coming year and beyond. So that's basically what I wanted to share with folks. Thanks so much, Josephine. Um, we're about to jump into our next breakout round, which will be uh, a lot about uh, action and political or advocacy and political action, um, understanding that those things are, are not mutually exclusive. And 
are our breakout rooms ready already? Um, <coughs> yes, our breakout rooms are ready. Um, and um, Josephine, I'm going to um, take the screen share from you to show the breakout room titles. Thank you. Okay, so um, we have our second round of breakouts um, and um, the groups are as follows. Um, Driving Policy Change, UN Food Summit and Canadian Policy. Driving Policy Change, Open Letter and GTA slash Ontario. And the third one is Change Through Political Action with Black Food Sovereignty. So thanks so much everyone for um, our breakout sessions. So I wanted to start with, um, let me see, where's our first one? Yes, I guess it's uh, it's mine, <laughs> it's ours. <laughs> so um, this is one I helped facilitate and this was driving uh, policy change um, and talking specifically about the UN Food Summit and Canadian policy. So uh, we went over the five action tracks of the um, UN Food System Summit, Safe Nutrition for All. Um, oh man, what was it? Uh, yes. Uh, shift to sustainable consumption patterns, boosting nature positive production, um, advancing equitable livelihoods, and building resilience to vulnerable shocks and stresses. We talked about um, sort of from the perspective of a couple of us who had been to and participated in larger events, um, the contrast between living in a uh, in a in a province in particular that gets away get that gets in the way bureaucratically of initiatives versus other parts of the world and other countries that kind of support people taking initiatives on um, living uh, in better communities with each other. So uh, we also talked about how Canada does not have a convener in the food summit. Um, we're not getting government much, uh, that much government support. Canada's like uh, wants to kind of hang out in the background um, and not and therefore sort of. Uh, you know, hopefully hide from the heat that uh, we think um, it needs in order to highlight the uh, human rights abuses that are going on here. So we talked about, and I wanted to put forward, um, going forward, a solution or an actual action that we can take that um, the UN Food Summit is allowing for our us as individuals and us as community organizers and participants in the food system, we can actually hold our own dialogue, our own UN food systems dialogue. And it is something that I think if people want to continue the kind of work we're doing in the forum, but have it be visible on the literal international stage, um, that's something we should continue to do. So that's just a quick and dirty um, overview of what we talked about in our uh, breakout room. Thanks so much. And then I'll pass it on over to uh, driving change through policy. Hey folks, how's it going? So we had a, we had a good discussion, I think about the um, kind of the open letter that was drafted. So uh, one area, uh, that was some big questions were, who is this letter addressed to? And what are kind of like, um, what, what, what's it trying to, what's trying to go? Who are we trying to, to kind of mobilize with these letters? And there's some uh, interesting commentary about how how this how this could be uh, let it be used. There's some uh, comments about how um, the letter kind of could have addressed more broader economic security or um, more details on how to really specifically achieve such, achieve some goals um, and of like more action items. For example, what kind of services are we asking for, or what kind of uh, action items are we concretely uh, trying to look for, for support for? And it was also kind of noted that this letter um, has also the potential of being used, um, uh, used for example, to uh, mobilize solidarity to kind of um, be able to uh, give weight to some to social movements and um, organized organizations doing uh, doing work, mobilizing projects. So kind of like showing this kind of like broad broad support, right? And um, it could be a useful kind of a catch-all for for many of us to kind of mobilize around. Um, and one thing that was really interesting as well, kind of uh, that was pointed out was that with um, with the letter, there's kind of like one uh, four four specific points of what uh, what's being asked for, and um, one one um, uh, one person kind of noted how the government's doing um, a few of these kind of claims and has policies doing to a few of these, but also this letter serves up as an opportunity opportunity to also uh, see how the government's kind of lacking or. Not not doing this uh, if effectively. How despite these kind of policies, this is how how they're falling short of actually responding to people's realities. So that's uh, kind of an interesting mobilization points for this uh, for this letter. Um, Dragos, I'm not sure if I I uh, meant I uh, left something out, but please jump in if you'd like. 
Uh, but that, that's kind of like the, a bit of a summary of what we talked about. I think you did an amazing job summarizing that and facilitating the group. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thank you, folks. Um, and then I wanted to just shift attention to the uh, last breakout, but certainly not least breakout room change through political action focusing on black food sovereignty. Okay, I can talk about um, what we talked about in there. Um, Anand did a lot of sharing for us, which was really appreciated. Um, of the work that they've been doing and the pressure that they've been placing and recommendations they've been making to um, the Board of Health about developing a Black Food Sovereignty Plan. Um, we also just talked about like what different things need to happen, um, including just like the ongoing conversations, developing connections, um, really like engaging uh, with the, the Black community and Black youth and just like having them involved in the process. Um, something that stuck out to me that Anand mentioned was how during like the COVID-19, how like, during the pandemic, um, the government will, or, or like throwing money at people to purchase food when like we could have been preparing uh, food growing processes in our community, like this whole time, we could have used that money in a lot of different ways if we had been, had strategic planning prior. Um, and so, so that was a lot of it was just like strategic planning um, and placing pressure on the government as well as um, hearing from community and creating a knowledge base for ecological and sustainable development across the board. Um, and also just like having, especially like urban youth on land. Um, I'm curious if there's something that people that I missed that anybody would like to add on there. Okay, I, yeah, I feel like that's good from us. Thank you. Awesome, thanks everybody. So I'm gonna stop sharing and uh, pass, it, pass it back to our host <laughs> as we wrap things up here. All right, I guess that's me. Um, okay, yeah, thanks so much everyone. Um, that's the bulk of the conversation. We are gonna have um, some time Right uh, after at nine o'clock, we'll have about 20 minutes just for open networking and discussion time and the this room will be open. I encourage everybody to, and let me just open it and I can screen share, but to check out the Emergency Food Forum Community Center. Um, so you can see, oh, so sorry. Um, so we've got recordings from session one, we've got the pre-registration survey as well as um, the results that Nolan shared at the beginning. Um, we'll have the session two recording as well as session three. When that happens, we've got our form notes and so, and as well as access to the Miro board where everybody has placed their um, information. I think that we'll, there, we've got some other links up here and I think we will add maybe to the, the forum notes, the various links and events that people have mentioned today. I know that um, Rhonda shared some great links and Anand shared the event. So we'll be sure to include those somewhere. Um, and I will, I'm not sure if there's someone that's doing the closing, maybe it's Josephine. Oh, uh, gee, um, well, I just wanna thank everybody for some great conversations. I wish we had a bit more time. Um, I will say also that we do have a base camp platform where people can share ideas and post information and stuff like that. And you will be um, getting more around how to get involved in that. It was a great way to keep people working after the last year's forum. You know, for us, we're hoping that both the EcoJust Food Network can bring together a variety of different partners, you know, urban and rural, um, to be able to actively work together on increasing our food supply and uh, helping each other out with the farming and the like. And then the Emergency Food Forum, we hope can serve as a sort of coalition platform so that organizations and folks involved in this work can have a voice, a collective voice without necessarily being targeted individually. 
um, so that we can make those challenging statements and demands so that we can expose the issues and help each other uh, move all this forward. So the Emergency Food Forum can continue to be sort of a megaphone in a way for you know, progressive regenerative food system development. And um, we're hoping that these conversations will just continue and people will self-organize. We're here as you know, unpaid volunteers who just really care a lot about this and wanna help bring everybody together. You know, there's a lot of wonderful organizations, farms, co-ops, et cetera. And we're just hoping that this space and these platforms will allow everyone to continue this work and uh, act as allies and act in solidarity. So yeah, I think um, once we are able to see each other and contact each other and make connections, build bridges, share resources, we can get a lot further, a lot faster. You know, there are many cultures that recognize that we all are much stronger when we're together. And we also know that the you know, corporate colonial system is always seeking to divide and conquer us. And there's always a risk of that. They will try to co-opt things. They will try to claim that they're doing the same things you are. How do we you know, make sure that we maintain our values and maintain our visions and don't allow the divide and conquer work to succeed? You know? So these are very important things. A lot of us also who have mixed heritage and mixed genetics are really um, invested in making sure that we can all work together, share the land, share the resources, walk the dish with one spoon treaty. So that's what we're, that's why we're doing all this. And we hope to keep on interconnecting and talking and working with all of you as we move forward. And for that, I think, um, you know, if uh, folks wanna hang around and just be able to chat with each other and ask questions and come up with say things that they didn't get to say in the breakout rooms, uh, we thought we'd create space for that. So, um, yeah. So for those who, <clears throat> you know, need to go at nine, um, I guess we're, Pat early, but for those who want to hang out and just be a part of an ongoing sort of hangout, um, you're more than welcome, and I will be here. Thank you so much, Josephine. I honor you. I respect you. This is great work. Great, great work. We know we come from far way down the line, and I'm so honored to be here with your leadership of this EcoJust Network. It's a beautiful thing who experiences this their business, but it's a good thing. <laughs> and, and, and people are gonna get paid. They're gonna get paid to do this work, yes. to, to do this beautiful work. This is beautiful work. Thank uh, you, man. A lot of people don't realize the beauty of this work as yet. <laughs> but this is life, this, this is the only way, this is, this is, this is healing the world. Mm. We're, doing, we're doing healing work. As I said, the capitalists and those with the big box who are just doing destructive things. We just got to pray and just do this work. We just got to farm together, grow together, whatever we could do together, build a solar panel, whatever, and just keep moving through. Because for this city, this is alternative. This city don't have this kind of gathering. This is a good thing, you know. This is a good thing, Josephine. And I just want you to get paid and do it <laughs> comfortable. And it's a beautiful thing. Thank you so much for inviting me to this. I honor you. I expect folks could register for the Black Food Sovereignty Conference because as I've said in my group, you know what I mean? That's what we're doing with the government. And we sit down and talking to them. We got to talk to them. Yeah, man. Yeah, okay. they, they learn, the thing about this is that they don't know. And we, we, don't. we, we bring in the good news. And humbly, they got some of them don't want to hear the good news, but we bring in the good news. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anan. And I bless you for the challenge you've taken on because, you know, the government works for us. They're supposed to work for us. We're paying them to work for us. So they need to be schooled in what they need to be doing. So well, it's a, a great job. Doing Thank you so job. much. It's a learning and, and this environment is a good learning environment. We just could get to know more, you know, and I'm glad I give my time to this. I'm honored to be a part of this. Thank you.